guys, it is the end of the longest series we have ever done here at the Father's House. We are concluding our summer series called The Answer. Yeah, give it up. You made it 16 weeks. 16 weeks. Congratulations. Uh, longest series we've ever done here, uh, and we've been calling it The Answer as we've been studying through the book of 1 Corinthians chapter by chapter all summer long. And, and I don't think I'm speaking for myself. I think I'm speaking for our community when I say this has been an absolutely transformative series for us. I, I don't know about you, but as we've studied through this ancient church, I really do feel like I've learned how to apply the gospel in a fresh way to my day-to-day -day life, and hopefully the same could be said of you. Uh, but if you are joining us today for the first time, uh, just you can catch up on all the previous messages online or uh, on the podcast, but uh, for one last time, I am going to give a brief uh, uh, recap of the series to date just so that you can get something from the message today. For those who've been here for the last 16 weeks, I'm sorry. Uh, if you've just been out of church for 16 weeks, Jesus said he missed you, welcome back. Uh, but here is the recap of the series that we've been in now for a few months. The reason we are studying through the book of 1 Corinthians and the reason we're calling this series The Answer is because our city of San Francisco is a lot like this ancient city called Corinth. Uh, like us, this was a port city, transient place where people were coming and going for work all the time. And it was widely recognized throughout the Roman Empire for its wealth and its influence far beyond its borders. Uh, but in addition to its reputation for wealth and influence, it was also widely recognized as a bit of a, a den of iniquity, a, a sinner's paradise, a sexually explorative place. Uh, as we've said every single week, it was the city you could go to be whoever you wanted to be, do whatever you wanted to do, indulge in whatever you wanted to indulge in and not be judged for it. In fact, you'd be celebrated for indulging in all of your sinful desires. But like us, the Apostle Paul felt that a city this dark was the perfect place to plant a church because he knew that the light of the gospel shines brightest in the darkest of cities. And so he showed up in AD 49, planted this amazing church. A bunch of people are getting saved and getting baptized and added into the family of God. And it grows so quickly that he feels like he can leave after about a year and a half to continue on in his church planting endeavors. Uh, but shortly after his departure, he received some frantic letters from these young believers who have discovered it is quite a bit more difficult to live for Christ than they realized in their Corinthian culture. They love God, but the Corinthian ways are making their way into the church. And so Paul responds to their letter with his own letter, which we now know as the book of 1 Corinthians. And problem by problem, issue by issue, he begins to address this church and show them how the gospel of Jesus Christ provides the answer. And since our cities are so similar, every single week we have taken a chapter from this book, we've contextualized the problem, and we've discovered that the gospel still works. The timeless truths of the gospel still show us now a couple thousand years later how to live for Christ in our San Francisco culture. And that's the last time you're ever gonna hear me have to say that from the stage. Hallelujah. You're gonna have nightmares about that introduction, all right? So here we are, the 16th week, the 16th chapter. Uh, only unlike many of the previous chapters, chapter 16 does not really deal with any problems that the church was facing. Instead, it serves as a bit of a, a conclusion to Paul's letter, a, a valediction to, to the end of his, his, his writings here. Uh, but contained in this conclusion is a spiritual principle that I want to unpack a little bit today because I believe it is equally as important, if not more so, than some of the problems we've addressed in the previous 15 weeks. However, before Paul deals with this spiritual principle, he, he begins to discuss a spiritual practice that he expects all the believers in the church of Corinth to engage in. And as I warned a moment ago, that practice has to do with giving. That's how he starts out this chapter. So before we do that, let me offer you a title. We'll pray, and then we'll get into our final installment in this series. Uh, I want to call this chat this morning, There's a Fight at Your Door. Come on, sounds provocative, right? Turn to somebody next to you, look them dead in the eyeballs, tell them there's a fight at your door. <laughs> if you're sitting next to someone single, tell them you'll protect them from the fight that's at their door. <laughs> someone first service said, there was a fight at my door this morning, I'm sitting next to my spouse. We fought before we came to church, so it's all relative. 
Let's pray and uh, invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us one last time in this series. God, thank you for your presence in this house. Thank you for what you're doing today. Thank you that you are here among us to do business. And God, we ask over the next couple of moments as we study one last time this ancient book that you would speak to us again, bear fruit once again as your word goes out. Thank you that according to scripture, it never returns void. Anytime the word is spoken, it produces what it intends to produce. So we receive all that you wanna speak to us today and we say yes and amen in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. So, so Paul starts out here in chapter 16 by saying this. He says, now regarding your question about the money being collected for the saints, you must follow the same command I gave to the churches in Galatia. On the first day of the week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. In other words, as you are paid, as you get your paycheck. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. So so leave it to, to Pastor Paul to offer a giving exhortation at the conclusion of his letter. I hope you've enjoyed everything I've said up until now. By the way, please don't forget to give. Typical pastoral behavior. But I, I'm not surprised when I read this in the conclusion of his letter because as I can attest, being a pastor of a young church, when you find yourself in a young church, made up a lot of a lot of young believers, in a culture that idolizes money and possessions, you are bound to find this issue. The, the issue of trusting God with the first and the best of your resource, with being a consistent percentage giver to the ministry that God has called you to be a part of, or as we would know it more practically, tithing, giving God the first tenth of your increase. And Paul now reminds them, and subsequently us now, a few thousand years later, that part of being a follower of Jesus, part of being numbered among the saints and a part of a church is to engage in this regular practice. He says, set it aside every single week or as you are paid, as you receive increase, I want you to participate in this regular percentage giving of your resource. It's part of being in the body of Christ. And he says it like this. He says, give it in proportion to your prosperity. In other words, the amount is going to differ from individual to individual. The income of a college student is gonna look different than the income of a medical person or, or an engineer. But while the amounts may vary, the practice should not. In a community of faith, there should be a collective decision. We participate in supporting what God is doing in and through the church, in and through the city. And Paul also says that this is somewhat of an urgent matter. He says, do it now. Come on, what are you doing? Do it now. He, He channels his inner Arnold and he encourages the church to be engaged in this practice. He says, don't wait weeks or months or years, and then finally when you decide to establish this rhythm in your practice of faith, you gotta gather up a whole bunch of extra resource because you weren't doing it for years. Just do it now, engage in the practice now. As it says in the book of Hebrews, uh, if today you hear the voice of the Lord, obey him. Don't do like the Israelites did in in the wilderness where they disobeyed and then after 40 years they finally chose to obey. No. Do it now. Obey the word of the Lord now. And so let me take advantage of the introduction of this chapter and what it offers us and just encourage you today. If this is not yet a regular practice in your faith, come on, what are you doing? Get into the church immediately. (laughs) Be a part of what God is doing in the community of the saints. Become a regular percentage contributor. And if that's a foreign concept to you, if you're like, yo, Tim, we just met and you're already asking me for this kind of stuff, I offer you a resource. I'm not going to preach about this today, but there's a QR code coming up on the screen. We have a doc on our website entitled Why We Give. It has a lot of scripture, a lot of teaching. If this is a foreign concept to you, I encourage you to educate yourself, find out what the scriptures have to say about it, and then pray and ask God how he would have you step in to this spiritual practice. Can we all agree to do that? Sound good? I'm not gonna, until you raise your hand, I'm not moving on, all right? This is, okay, thank you, we're moving on. (laughs) For the next 47 minutes, we're gonna talk about giving. No, all right, Paul now, after addressing giving, gets into the more exciting portion of this book where he says this in, in chapter 16, verse nine. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you for I'll be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you for a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I don't want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. In the meantime, I will be staying here at Ephesus until Pentecost. And here's why. There is a wide open door for a great work here. And there are many who oppose me. 
So some translations say there's a wide open door for an effective work and there are many adversaries. Suddenly we understand why this door is sitting behind me. As the title suggests, there is a fight at your door. So, so scripture uses the analogy of doors quite a bit. In fact, as I was studying this week, I discovered uh, one theologian said it was used 400 times throughout the scriptures in metaphorical form. And, and as soon as I read that, I, I, I took a little note. I have a, a document in my phone about potential sermon series. And I'm like, we should do a sermon series on doors. So for the next 400 weekends, what we're going to be discussing here, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you thought this series was long. Buckle up. The door series is going to get a little boring. 400 times. It, it is mentioned quite a bit throughout the scriptures. And virtually every time this metaphor of a door is used in the Bible, it is used to describe an opportunity that's being presented to us. Uh, in Revelation chapter 3, speaking of opportunities, uh, the, the, the writer John says that God opens doors that no man can shut, and he shuts doors that no man can open. Later, Jesus says in that same chapter of the opportunity for salvation, behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock and anyone who opens up that door to me, I'll come in and we will dine together. Again, Jesus uses the analogy when he speaks about this opportunity for persistent prayer. He says, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Over and over again, all throughout the Bible, you will see this metaphor, this analogy of doors. And Paul is, is not unfamiliar to this. In fact, he uses that same analogy quite frequently in his letters. Often when he speaks of opportunities that God is opening up to him, he uses the analogy of a door. However, here, he tells us something about these doors of opportunity that might come as a surprise, maybe even a dissuasion or a discouragement for some. In no uncertain terms, Paul tells us that open doors often equal opposition. When an open door is presented to you, there's a good chance it will be opposed. Remember how he said it. He said, a wide open door for a good work has been opened up to me, and there are many adversaries. Notice how he didn't use the word but. He used the word and. But would assume that it was unexpected, that he didn't suspect he was going to have to deal with some adversaries or some opposition on the way. Instead, he uses the word and as if to say, guys, I need you to understand, when doors are open to you from God, there's going to be some opposition. You should expect opposition when God is calling you into a new season. In fact, opposition might be the very evidence that you're stepping into something new. Now, before I go too down, far down this road, allow me to offer a preemptive disclosure, yet another one, because this is important. If I don't say this, someone's gonna misquote me and they're gonna post about it and then there's gonna be a documentary and I don't wanna be in a documentary, right? <laughs> Success in ministry in 2023 is not having a documentary written about you. That's, that's what I'm aiming for this year's. So, so, so let me offer this disclaimer. Not all opposition is hinting to opportunity. Sometimes opposition has nothing to do with opportunity. It has to do with the poor decisions you've made. All right? Let, let me give you an example. Um, if you get fired from your job because you show up late all the time or because you're not doing a very good job, that's not the devil opposing you. <laughs> that's on you. If your car gets towed because you stopped paying your car payment or because you, you didn't pay the 30 parking tickets in your glove compartment and the city's like, I'll take that vehicle, thank you, that's on you. <laughs> That has nothing to do with the devil. Oh, the devil's just opposing. No, you just didn't pay your parking tickets. Some opposition is the result of sowing and reaping. I love this quote. I don't know who originally came up with it, but I've used it many times from this stage, and I offer it again today for your edification. Everything happens for a reason, and sometimes that reason is because you make bad decisions. <laughs> I feel like that should be in the book of Proverbs somewhere, like, oh, thank you, Lord. It's a really good statement. Now, that said, if you are experiencing opposition in your life, but you survey the landscape and you determine, okay, I didn't bring this one on myself. I've not, I'm not reaping what I've sown. This is not the byproduct of my own poor decisions, and yet I still feel like I'm coming up against some opposition. Then it might be a spiritual indicator for you that God has opened up a door and there's some opposition you need to make your way through in order to get to that opportunity. And I think even in the natural, that kind of tracks. It makes sense, doesn't it? 
I mean, when you think about this life and even the good things that we wanna lay hold of in this life, often they do not come without a fight. There's some opposition involved. You want a healthy marriage, it's gonna be a fight. You want a relationship with your kids that goes far beyond their, uh, their adolescence and into adulthood, that's gonna be a fight. You, you wanna advance in your career, you wanna get the degree, you wanna move forward in your vocation, there is a bit of a fight. There's some challenges that you're gonna have to overcome in order to get to those things. Physical health is a fight. Can I get a witness? Especially if you are given to the temptation of that, that refined sugar that loves to work its way into your life. Every single week, I face that adversary in spherical glazed form on our porch, and I say, no, in Jesus' name. And they say, but come over here, Pastor Tim. And then, ah. <laughs> and I fail the fight every single week. Thanks, Mom and Dad, who buy those donut holes for us. I appreciate you. <laughs> Everything good in life comes on the other side of a fight. And if it's true in the natural, then we shouldn't be surprised that it's also true in the spirit. If the good things of life require a fight, then so do the good things of God. Purity is gonna be a fight. Integrity is gonna be a fight. Freedom is going to be a fight. Shoot, waking up early, reading your Bible and praying every single day, that is a fight sometimes. Coming to church on Sunday can be a fight. Even your salvation is a fight. Not, not, not to obtain it, that's a free gift from God. But buckle up, buttercup, when you say yes to Jesus, you got a fight on your hands. You painted a target on your back. The enemy is not pleased with your decision to follow Jesus, and the last thing he wants you to do is leverage your life for the cause of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. So yeah, you got a fight on your hands now. That's why Paul says to Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. It's because faith is a fight. And we need to remember this. I think so often as believers, we wrongfully assume that, that an opposition is, is evidence of a closed door, but we need to remember that opposition and adversaries in the spirit are often proof that there is a wide open door being presented to us if we are willing to fight our way through it. Which brings me to this beautifully crafted sermon prop behind me. I don't want it to go to waste. Uh, and in fact, I need a couple of volunteers to join me on the stage. Uh, let me get you, JT. Hey, come on, Eduardo, you wanna come up? Yeah, I'm gonna borrow Eduardo, you come on up. Give it up for his baptism today, that was awesome. Uh, BJ, John, let me get you. Where's Dom at? Dom's got some big shoulders. Where you at, Dom? Oh, come on, okay, I need Dom real quick. Come on down. And then, um, where's Ashley? Where's Ashley at? Ashley, can I borrow you real quick? <laughs> <laughs> Give it up for Ashley. Right. <laughs> Hold for one moment here. Let's move this over here. We throw that sandbag on the back. All right, gentlemen and lady, I need you to stand in front of this door if you could. Ashley, why don't you stand in the back there? Gentlemen, why don't you stand in front of her, please? Yeah, you two. You, you two guys, come on. Right over here, right in the front, right in the front. There we go. <laughs> I'm building the security team over here at the Father's house, all right? <laughs> okay, listen, listen, listen. This is often what opportunity looks like. There's a wide open door, but there are many adversaries. There, there's a wide open door, but in front of that door, there's a bunch of opposition. And that opposition comes by many different names, doesn't it? It, it can be financial opposition. Like, I, I don't know how we're going to afford it. I don't know how that's going to happen. I've never been able to, to make that kind of money. I don't qualify for that. So, so the financial opposition can try to talk you out of it. Or, or it, it can be the irreconcilable things like the red tape or, 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 or the paperwork or the hoops that you've got to jump through that feel like this is impossible. There's no way that, that I'm going to be able to make it through all of these walls that came, seem to keep showing up in front of me. Or even maybe, as, as Paul said, there, there are literally people that are opposing you. He said, many oppose me. And many of you know that there are individuals in your life, sometimes we even live in the same household, that would love to see you held back. They'll discredit your reputation, they'll speak down to you, tell you that someone like you doesn't get to walk through a door like that. There are many adversaries. Uh, but beyond all them, sometimes, there's another little adversary. <laughs> 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 
It's that little voice in your head that tries to talk you out of it. You don't qualify, your past, your pedigree, your failures, you're not educated enough, you're not experienced enough. It's not that the adversary is large in and of itself, but it sure does know how to run its mouth. Sorry. But this is what opportunity looks like. It doesn't show up as an uncontested door, it shows as a door that is guarded by opposition. And the enemy would love to get you to focus all of your attention on the adversaries and the opposition because he knows if you fixate on the opposition, you will forfeit the opportunity. You will assume, okay, God must be closing this door. I can't make it my way through it. And so you just walk away from the door he's opened to you. But Paul tells us here in chapter 16 that we need to consider this through a different lens. When we see adversaries, when we see spiritual opposition, it is not an excuse to flee, it is an invitation to fight. We dig our heels in and we say, I will get to the door that God has called me to walk through. This is proof that I'm in the center of God's will, not evidence that I'm walking away from it. And if that sounds like preacher talk, let me offer you some Bible. David had a giant he needed to get through in order to get into the land of the Philistines. Joshua had some walls that needed to fall down before he was able to walk into the promised land. Joseph had to go through a pit and a Potiphar and a prison before he made his way into the palace. And if it was the case for them, it is going to be the case for you. You don't get to breeze through some uncontested doors. No, you're gonna need to fight through some opposition if you're gonna make your way to the door. Because listen, God never promised you that the enemy would not fashion weapons against you, but he did promise that they would not prosper. He did not prof- uh, promise you a battle-free life, but he did promise you that you are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. And he did not promise you that you would not come up against opposition or adversaries, but he said, greater is the one who lives on the inside of me than the one that I'm facing, so I'm not gonna tuck tail and run. I'm gonna dig in my heels. I'm gonna push some opposition aside, and I'm gonna make my way through the doors that God is calling me to walk through in Jesus' name. Take your seats. Give it up for these guys one more time. Thank you, Ashley. First service, it was my daughter, because <laughs> she does a lot of that. And she asked me yesterday, can I come on stage with you? I said, yeah. After which she's like, I don't want to go on stage with you anymore. I'm like, okay, you lesson learned, lesson learned. Someone say there's a fight at my door. Opposition is often an indicator that you are stepping into opportunity. Now, if that's true, then it tells us something, doesn't it? It tells us that we should be suspicious when we find ourselves in front of doors with no opposition. It tells us that when we seem like we're walking through something that just fell in our laps, if it's too easy, maybe we should be a little bit suspicious about that door. As your grandma used to tell you, if it feels too good to be true, it probably is. Why? Because just as the enemy will use opposition to deter you from a door, he will leave unguarded doors for you to walk through knowing that they will lead to your demise. So don't be surprised when some wide open doors present themselves to you in deceptive form. Don't be surprised when there's a wide open door for that job opportunity you've been hoping for. The only thing you have to compromise is going to church on Sundays, being a part of a community of believers, and time with your family and your kids. If you're willing to do that, then you can have it. I'd be suspicious. Don't be surprised when a wide open door for a relationship shows up on your doorstep, but the only thing you have to compromise, even though they tick all the boxes, is that one box that matters most, which is their conviction that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and the only way to get to the Father. And don't be surprised when it feels like, wow, I don't know how I can accomplish the goals so much faster. All I had to do was fudge a few numbers and compromise my integrity a little bit to walk through that door. I'd be suspicious. Just because it's open doesn't mean you're supposed to walk through it. Just because it pays more doesn't mean you're supposed to take it. Just because they're available doesn't mean you're supposed to date it. Come on, somebody. (laughs) The enemy will leave unguarded doors in hopes that you'll walk through it 
and end up on the wrong path. But man, if there's a fight at the door, if there's some opposition you're facing, then there's probably a good chance it is exactly where God wants you. You just gotta fight for it. And nobody knew this better than the Apostle Paul. Time and time again, we see this reality play out in his life. Not just here in 1 Corinthians 16 when he's speaking about an opportunity in Ephesus that's been presented to him, but actually in the very church we've been studying for the last 15 weeks. This is a reality that Paul came to know very intimately even from the beginning of his tenure in ministry. In fact, had, had Paul not recognized that opposition leads to opportunity, we would not have had a church to study for the last 15 weeks in this series. Let me show you what I mean. So, so chapter 16, yes, it does act as the conclusion to this letter, but when Paul makes these statements about open doors and opportunities, this conclusion actually ends up pointing back to the beginning, the genesis of the Corinthian story. Because before a church could ever be planted in Corinth, there were some adversaries that needed to be addressed. Look at what happens to Paul as he shows up in this city in Acts chapter 18, verse one. It says, after leaving Athens, Paul went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, it's a rap name, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade the Jews and the Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to the preaching, testifying to Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. And then look at this verse. But when they opposed Paul, when there were some adversaries, when there were some walls, when they insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and he said, your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go and preach to the Gentiles. See, see for a moment, it appears as though th this Corinthian city wants nothing to do with the gospel that Paul is preaching. They, they're rejecting what Paul is offering. And Paul's initial response to this opposition is to leave. He says, I'm taking my gospel and I'm going home. He doesn't want to stay there any longer. But as Paul mistakenly assumes that opposition is evidence that Corinth is a closed door, Jesus begins to speak to the apostle and remind him that opposition is actually evidence of the contrary. That Corinth is actually wide open for ministry if Paul will see this opposition correctly. Look at what he goes on to say, verse 11, excuse me, verse nine. It says, one night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent, for I am with you and no one will attack you and harm you. Many people in Corinth, many people in San Francisco, many people in the Bay Area belong to me. And when Paul heard that, what did he do? So he stayed, he dug in his heels, he planted himself in Corinth for the next year and a half teaching the word of God. If Paul had not recognized that opposition was evidence of opportunity, he would have left this city prematurely. He would have said, this opposition is proof that I'm not supposed to be here, I'm going on to the next city to plant a church. But instead, Jesus comes to Paul and says, son, you're not seeing this right. You think the enemy's gonna give up a city like Corinth that easily? You think the gospel is just gonna all of a sudden build a giant church and you're gonna walk into a city like this that the enemy has gripped for decades, uncontested? No, there's a fight on your hands, son. But that opposition is not proof that I've closed this door. That opposition is proof that this is exactly where I've called you. So speak out, keep preaching, don't bail because many people in this city belong to me. Now that's Paul's story, but we're not here to give a history lesson about somebody else. You got your own story. So one last time, allow me to pose a question in this series, forcing every single one of us to personalize this content. As the worship team comes and we prepare to conclude, let me ask you this question. If opposition is evidence of opportunity, what door do you need to fight for? Where have you mistaken opposition as a closed door? What battles have you forfeit? 
What ground have you given back over to the enemy because you assumed it wasn't yours to fight for? Where have you quit too soon? Where should you have been fighting the good fight of faith, but you've been fleeing in the other direction? What door do you need to fight for? As I was studying this week, I wrote this down, and as you're mulling that question in your head, let me, let me read this out. I wonder how many opportunities have been forfeit because of an unwillingness to embrace opposition. I wonder how many ministries were never birthed, businesses never built, marriages never restored, relationships never mended, mended churches never planted, degrees never obtained, missionaries never sent, or moments never seized because of mistaken opposition or an unwillingness to fight. May that not be your story. Maybe the reason your marriage is experiencing so much opposition right now is because that irreconcilable difference is the crucible whereby God is fashioning weapons that he will allow you to use in helping other people fight for their marriages when they walk through the same situation. Maybe there's a ministry on the other side of that opposition. Maybe the walls and the red tape you're facing to start that business or advance in that career is not because you're not called to that position or you're called to that vocation, but because the enemy knows that the moment you get there, you will leverage your resource and your influence to see people come to Christ. And the last thing he wants to do is to see you arrive at that destination. So he's doing everything in his power to oppose. Maybe the reason you keep coming up against those walls that seem unscalable or the opposition that seems unstomachable is because on the other side of that opposition is exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask, think, or imagine. And the job you have is to not walk away in fear, but to fight to walk through that door. Maybe there's something greater on the other side. Maybe your opposition is proof of the opportunity. Unless I make this personal for you without making it personal for us, allow me to border over share for just a moment if I could. Thank you, Justin. He's preaching me on from behind me. I like it. Our church is in a situation where we find ourself, ourselves at the threshold of an open door right now and there are many adversaries. If you've been coming here for any length of time, you know that we have not been shy in sharing from this stage that we believe one of the wide open doors God has made available to us is the ownership of the facility that we're sitting in right now to make this a permanent home for the glory of God, to plant roots and not be tenants, but to slap a new logo out there and paint some guys on the walls and redeem some land for the kingdom of Jesus. And we've shared that many times. But perhaps unbeknownst to many in the room, we've actually been in that conversation for the last couple of months with the ownership of this facility uh, by way of a series of miraculous events that I don't have time to describe today. We found ourselves a few weeks ago sitting in a conference room outside that lobby with a committee of Masons that had been appointed to hear our offer and make a decision as to whether or not they would sell this building to us. We had gotten the building appraised and. We made the best offer that we possibly could based on the amount of money we thought we could raise and the amount of money we have in our possession right now and our, our income and our giving. And it was my hope that next week on our five year anniversary, I'd be able to stand on the stage and make an announcement to our community that guys, after five years of contending, God has brought every promise about this building to completion. We're in contract, now you gotta pay for it. That was my hope. But unfortunately, our offer was not accepted. And I don't get to stand on the stage and make that announcement next week. Why? Because a wide open door has been presented to us, but there are many adversaries. There is opposition. You don't get to take possession of such a strategic arterial access point of the city like this without some opposition. And yeah, we got some adversaries. We've come up against some financial adversaries. There's about a $4 million gap between 
what we can raise and our affordability and what I believe they would take to walk away. <laughs> but, but in addition to that, we need a lot more people at the Father's house to do what we talked about at the beginning of this sermon, to trust God with the first and the best of their resources, to be regular, consistent percentage givers in the house. You know that our church has grown roughly 30% over the last year in attendance. However, our finances have somewhat flatlined. That number has not been consistent with our numerical growth. And to a lender whom you're asking to give you millions of dollars to buy a building, that don't look so good. They like to see those numbers tracking in the same direction. So we need a lot more people to step in and trust God with their resources. But beyond that, there are the adversaries of over-evaluation. A couple of members on the board of Masons that believe this building to be far more valuable than the appraisal suggests. And we need God to get a hold of their hearts. How many know that God can even get a hold of a heart of someone who doesn't know Him and move it for the cause of the kingdom? And we need God to do that on our behalf. In addition, we got economic adversaries, financial adversaries, interest rates are higher than they've been in a long time, affecting our affordability. And beyond all of those, we got that little mouth running adversary that's saying, maybe you didn't hear the prophetic word correctly. Maybe that wasn't God. Maybe you've been clinging to a promise that isn't yours. You got no business as a five-year-old church stepping into a facility of this magnitude. You can't do it, you'll never do it, it wasn't him. So we got a lot of adversaries. And yet still there is an open door. In fact, there are multiple open doors to us right now. Some uncontested, which makes me suspicious. Is this the God door? Or should we be standing in front of the one we have to fight for to get through? So you could say this sermon is a little, little personal to me this week. If I've been a tad rowdy, that's why. I'm living this out right now. But can I tell you that when I read this story of what Jesus said to the Apostle Paul as he was getting ready to flee Corinth because he assumed the people didn't want him there any longer, as something began to rise up on the inside of me as I, as I felt the Holy Spirit speaking those same words over this community. As Jesus said to Paul, I believe he would say to the Father's house today, don't be silent, don't be afraid, keep preaching the gospel in your city. Don't cut and run, stand your ground, keep proclaiming that I'm good, I'm still above it all, I am with you, and there are many people in the city of San Francisco that still belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't get to take this land without a fight, but if you fight, I will be with you, and you will walk through that door and be victorious. So let me tell you how we're gonna to respond to opposition. We're not running away. Come on, we're standing our ground, we're planting our feet, and we are fighting for every open door that God has made available to us, including but not limited to a permanent home in the city of San Francisco to plant our roots down deep and declare until Jesus returns, this will be a house for His glory because no weapon formed against us is gonna prosper, no plan of the enemy is gonna prevail, no human effort is gonna distract us. We're gonna swing and fight until we walk through the doors that Jesus has called us to walk through. Come on, somebody, hallelujah. Because there's a fight at our door, but we're not walking away. Sit down, sit down. Guys are gonna make me start a building financial campaign before it's time. <laughs> you say that, but you don't mean it. <laughs> you gotta fight, you gotta fight. What the Beastie Boys say? You gotta fight for your right. <laughs> the gospel according to Beastie Boys. Last scripture. It's how Paul signs off the letter. It's how we want to sign off this series with us. It's commissioning. May it stir your spirit to fight all the more for the things that God's called you to fight for. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. He says, be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. And do everything with love. May the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you.
Those are fighting words. And this is a fighting church. We're not backing down. We're walking through every door that God's made available to us. Come on, let's pray as we conclude. Uh, Holy Spirit, we, we have ears tuned. We have ears tuned to what you're speaking to the church in this season. We thank you that the doors you open, no man can shut. And so Father, right now, we, we lean in. We plant our feet. We adjust our posture. And we hear like the general of an army telling the troops it's time to go to war. We hear the call. We say yes. And we fight. I pray, Holy Spirit, for every door that's represented in this room door to a, a healthy marriage once again, a door to start a business or obtain a degree so that what we step into can be used for your kingdom. Every door represented. God, we remind ourselves right now, greater is the God that lives in us than the enemies we face. And if we fight, we win. One, one last group of people I want to pray for before we conclude today and that would be those in the room this morning who would say the door I need to open up this, this morning is the door of salvation as we quoted uh, Revelation chapter 3 earlier Jesus would say to you behold I stand at the door and I knock if you let me in man, I'll change your life and here's the beauty of, of that door as it presents itself you don't have to clean yourself up fix your life up before you can walk through it. We'll be talking about this next week as our anniversary service, but you can come fresh off a all night bender, smelling like sin. And Jesus still opens that door wide to you. He says, come as you are, I'll take you. And if that's you this morning, if you need to give your life to Christ, whether it's a recommitment or for the first time, and step through that door, I wanna pray with you, a prayer of commitment. So, so quickly, would you just lift up your hand and look at me and say, I want to be included in that prayer today. Thank you, bro. I got you. Yeah. Right over there, ma'am. I got you. Yeah, right here. Thank you, sis. Right over here, bro. Awesome. That's right. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got you. All right on. Thank you. Got in the back. Right on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Both services, man. So many people coming to Jesus today. All right, here's what we're doing, church. We're going to pray with these, making this decision out loud. Let's be bold so they don't feel alone. Say, Jesus, today I give you my life. I thank you for giving yours for mine. I choose to follow you. Forgive me of my sin and help me to be your disciple from this day forward until I see you in eternity. In Jesus' name, come on, celebrate like the angels are celebrating in heaven right now for every single one of those people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.